you added that last piece, right? <laughs> bueno, buenos dias. Good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for this space. We'll definitely talk about the Innovation Center and what we can do. And Chloe, thank you so much for grounding us. Uh, to my old friends, thank you for coming twice. I heard that Darius was here last week. <laughs> You didn't say it was a secret. Uh, and to those of you who I don't know, hopefully we'll be friends uh, by the end of this. So when Evan said like, hey, do you want to come and talk at this thing? I'm like, wait, why me? Like I'm nor a creative nor Zen. So why do you want me at a creative Zen event? Um, but I said like, you know what? Like, yes, like the way we, we think about social challenges and how we try to innovate around that, it has... Uh, to do with a lot of resilience and creativeness. Um, so I'll take the challenge um, and I'll do two things. One is the wear, to wear like the most art, artsy thing that I could think of. So I was like, okay, what can I wear if I would be going to Art Basel? Hence the hat. But now that we're in that space, I'm going to take it off because I feel more comfortable without it. Um, and secondly, uh, to kind of talk about my life through the analogy of art, I'm going to do my best because that's not a lot of vocabulary that I manage in English, um, but that's what I'm going to try to do today. Uh, but before I go there, I want to hear some of those inner conversations that you had out loud. Um, Chloe asked us to, to ask ourselves, why are we here? And I know we're in a university. You don't need to raise your hand. I just want you to say out loud why you're here. Is it the food? Evan forced you? Inspiration? Just say it out loud. I want to I hear some of that. Inspiration? Community? Connection? New people, socialize, okay, curiosity, okay, awesome. They're not here for me, you see, Evan, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so no matter what your beliefs are in terms of the, the story of origin, right? Whether you believe it was God, it was science, it was genes, it was aliens, Let's go back to 1986. That's when I was born in this very beautiful and tiny country called Guatemala. And I am the product of the love, I like to think, of a very young biologist who was one of the first environmentalist people in my country trying to preserve protected areas in Guatemala. So that was my dad. And then I'm also the product of this woman who's in all honesty, the best gatherer I have ever met, right? There, there was always food at home. There was always... In Spanish, we say, échale más agua a la sopa, right? Like if you're making soup, just put a little bit more water and people can just come. And so, so I'm, I'm a product of that, right? So when I was born, uh, again, I don't know if it was God, genes, the doctors, whatever. They said like, you know what? Let's put a lot of determination into this woman, right? So like, boom, there you go. And then it's like, you know what? Like we're going to make it, like make her curious, right? Like let's, let's make her a very determined person that's curious about every single thing in life. And then... Um, it was like, okay, if, the, if she's going to be determined and she's going to be very curious and therefore ambitious, she's going to need a lot of empathy, right? So boom, there you have it. And just to make sure that she's not an asshole, excuse my language, let's put more empathy into it, right? So all the empathy that my brothers didn't get, I got it. Uh, so I was ready to leave that room, right? With my determination, with the curiosity and with, with empathy. And right when I was ready to leave that hospital, they said like, you know what? Before you leave, let's just give her a ton of tears because she's going to need them along the way. And you will probably see some of that because I'm uh, now I'm trying to be a proud crier when I'm angry, when I'm happy, when I'm emotional, when I get nervous, etc. So giving you permission to cry with me and for you all to stay chill if I cry because I can keep talking and crying at the same time. OK, so here's my analogy. I want you all, especially the ones who are artists in the room, to picture yourself in an empty gallery. It's an amazing room just like this, but there's nothing in it but blank canvases. And there I am, like dropped into this door, at, at, like looking at this gallery, and all I have is a ton um, number, or like or, or an, an, an immense number of brushes and a lot of colors, right? And then there's instructions in terms of the techniques that I could use. Uh, and this is where I don't have the language you see in terms of oleo, like what um, aquarelas, like there are all these different types of, of paints that I can use, right? And the colors and, and the cells. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm ready, right? Okay. So there I, I was like, let's say five, six years old. 
in this very colorful country. Guatemala, like the, the half of the, the population is Mayan, right? They don't look at like me at all, right? I'm, I'm a minority in that country in terms of the color of my skin. Um, so it's a very colorful country. We're all tiny. There's a lot of nature and biodiversity in every single sense that you can think of. We speak more than 20 languages within the country. So I had access to all those colors, right? So I start painting. And I, the, the first things that I can remember of like this first stage in my life, that, that painting would look like me being a ballet dancer. Because I was the youngest girl in a family and they're like, okay, you like to dance, like ballet lessons, right? So imagine all the the light pink and thin thin people, right? Let's go back to the 90s. And, and that was okay back then. But I, I didn't really fit in that, right? Because I was a little like stronger than that. I was like, I don't want to be this feminine, right? And this, this gentle. So like, let's try gymnastics, right? Second painting. Okay, gymnastics, the opposite, right? I had to jump. I had to learn how to balance, etc. I was like, no, 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 like this is too much. Like this is too much for me. And then it's like, okay, school starts. So let, let's paint something around cheerleading, right? So as a cheerleader, and because I was extra, extroverted and determined, I was the leader of the cheerleading squad, like seven years old, right? Like, <laughs> no new expectations. But I felt like I was ruling the world, right? Le leading that. that. Um, so I was excelling at school, definitely an overachiever. Then someone tells me about tap dancing. Um, and I was like, that's cool. Like, let's stomp the floor, right? So I, I became a jazz and a tap dancer uh, in the mid-90s. And while I was continuing to school. So fast forward to my teenage years, I start getting more curious about my dad's job and I start traveling with him. Right. And that is, I always say it's both a blessing and a curse that I had the opportunity to really explore my country and to go outside of the capital and outside of the city to see all of those realities, right. From black beaches to very high mountains and volcanoes. And therefore the communities that live lived are around those, those areas. And I started noticing a lot of differences, right. Uh, from the color of our skin, from the way we dress, from the way we talked, um, from badass human rights explorers that were in the field, boots on, um, to very fancy folks that were at conferences with my dad as well. So I was like, okay, like all, all of these things exist and coexist in this country, but not a lot of people know about the other reality, right? So I think that kind of became a trend um, in my life. So then the moment, that big moment where you need to decide what are you going to do for the rest of your life when you're 17 years old, um, so when I was looking like, okay, I like being a leader here. I danced here. I did this at school. I want to teach all the things that I, that I, that I've learned. Right. And in Guatemala, when you're done with high school, um, all you have to do is to do one more year and then you become a teacher. So you're basically at 19 years old, you're ready to teach the next generation about everything they will have to navigate through life. And my dad said like, no, that is a waste of time. You need to go straight to university and start getting to work. I listened to him. He was wrong, evidently. Um, but I went to school and I was like, what, what do I do with this? I knew that I wanted to do this cliche thing of like helping my country and helping people, right? And becoming better. Um, so I, I started exploring all the humanitarian careers that you can, you can explore. So there's my other painting, my college season, right? Um, psychology was the closest thing to what I wanted to do, which, which was to listen to people, understand what the gifts were, how can we do and deal with that together? Uh, so I start painting this other painting, right? Of very nerdy things, Freud, Jung, like wh whomever you can think of, Viktor Frankl. Uh, I read so much that I don't like reading anymore. Um, but I was kind of like painting things at the same time because in the morning I would paint this thing, this very ner nerdy aspect. But then I would go to um, like my house, do my homework. And then after that, I became a receptionist at a gym. It was amazing. So I would, I would go to school, like study all these nerdy things. And then my other painting, think of athletes, spinning instructors. That, that was what me, my afternoon looked like. And then in the evening, I would like shift again and I would keep painting, painting my dancing uh, or my dancer life. And I taught jazz and tap at the same time. So that was, <laughs> I see your eyes, Simon. <laughs> you didn't know this. <laughs> so at this point, I have like 10, 15 paintings, right? And I was like 23, 24 years old. Um, and to top it all off, I started volunteering because I was like, all these things that I'm doing are not necessarily going to get me to the UN, which is where I wanted to work. Um, so 
I grab another canvas and I start painting my volunteering work. And this is where I start doing very crazy things to go to very remote locations in my country, taking public buses because I needed to be back for school and then going back to my spinning lessons and jazz classes. Um, so I do a lot of crazy things there. Um, but I think that's where my social impact career real, really started, right? Uh, so that's another painting, right? Things start getting a little bit more organized, I think, in my brain and in the way I'm coloring my canvas um, because I really enjoyed facilitating. And I became a, a co-facilitator for, uh, it, it was somewhat of a course, if you want to see it that way. In Spanish, we call it Diplomado in Mental Health and Human Rights. So there I was in a room nothing like this, uh, with 50, 60 rural leaders that didn't really speak languages that the, the, in which they could communicate with each other. Many of them didn't know how to read or write, but they were leading their communities in terms of like women, like you do not deserve to be to keep being beaten by your husbands, right? Or kids should be going to school, no matter if you're a girl or, or a man. Um, so so I, this, these were the people that I was working with, right? And I did that for two years. And after two years of volunteering, I said like, okay, are we doing this or not? So I get hired by this very small nonprofits in, in Guatemala. So I start painting a new painting, right? Because now I was, I was the lead facilitator and I was doing this. And it was so hard. My painting started getting very sad and frustrated because all, all I was hearing is, I want to do this. We want to do this. We have no money. We cannot take transportation. There was a lot of frustration. So I was like, I, again, it goes back to the inconsistency and the incoherence of things. So my painting starts getting angry, right? Like, what, what, what is this system doing, right? For these leaders who are literally so resourceful and doing so many things for their communities in a system that, first of all, doesn't see them. And secondly, doesn't really do, do, like, do much for them, right? Um, so I was like, again, 25, 26 years old, super passionate. And I'm like, okay, new painting. So I need to study something else. I need to go elsewhere where things are bigger, where things are bolder. So I start looking at things in the United States, in Europe. I'm like, I, I need to better understand how to work on the systemic side of things. So new painting, travel with me to Leiden in the Netherlands. I got a full ride to, to study a master in international NGOs there. And all of a sudden, my identity, which was a very white identity in my country, uh, this badass women who spoke two languages in a country that not a lot of people do, got a full ride to go to the Netherlands. When I get to the Netherlands, like, oh, welcome. You're from Guatemala. Do you live in trees? And I'm like, no, I don't. Um, and in order to pay for my for for my um, university, right, in the residence, I had to work. So I was a resident assistant. So that's another thing. I know how to deal with dryers and laundry rooms, etc. Um, and people would would look down on me, right? Like this woman from Guatemala that doesn't know anything. She's got no scholarship. She's doing these things. So I'm so grateful for that, right? Because it, it was literally I was the same person, but I was perceived in such a different way. And also in the classroom, because in Guatemala, I then started recognizing my privilege, right? Because um, I don't come from a rich family. So back home, I didn't really feel like that. But then I was when I was working there. But when I go into the Netherlands, it's like, oh, Guatemala, like the UN doesn't even know where the country is. The Security Council of the United Nations is making all the decisions around the world. So I was like, oh, wow, like I'm here and I'm this very tiny thing and my country doesn't really matter. And therefore, the people that I work with is like even smaller. So next painting, a lot of confusion, right? Like, what am I going to do with all of this? Um, and I start painting a story of love at the same time. Um, and we both like traveling a lot. So after I was done with my master's, we decided to move to Costa Rica out of love. And I was like, okay, I love traveling, right? Which is another painting that I love in my life. So suitcases and adventures and 40 plus countries that I've had the privilege to explore. Um, and I start thinking like, what do I do with all of this, right? Should I say rural development? Should I say sustainable development? Should I say nonprofit management? What is it? Long story short, new painting in San Jose, Costa Rica. I become the director of cooperation and public relations at a university. Um, and they hire me to make sure that Nicaraguan immigrant um, population has access to school and, and has the opportunity to go to university. But the university was a mess. So all of a sudden, my mom, who I told you was the one of the best gatherers, all the, the 
crafty things that she did, right? In terms of colors and making things match. I, I kind of rebranded the university. I'm like, do you have pamphlets? No, we don't. Okay, let's create them. What is the brand of this? So I ended up doing some of that, right? So uh, a very colorful pin picture there. Two years after uh, my husband gets transferred to Chile and I'm like, okay, we go to Chile, right? So now we go to the South. The painting looks very white because of the snow, very dry because of the desert. Uh, and I worked with a Guatemalan institution there to promote culture. And this dream of the UN always was with me, right? Uh, and I really wanted to work for UN. And then I had a very clear idea that gender equity, I think, was what was a pillar since I was a ballerina at three all the way to my, my late 20s. Uh, so I started applying and I got in. So then I moved back to Guatemala, to my colorful country. And th this painting looks very blue, which is the color of the UN. It looks very brown, because I don't know why I think of brown as the color of desks and suitcases and bureaucracy. And I was miserable. I was in my dream job and I hated it with my whole heart. It was so hard to come up with innovative ideas. It was so hard to navigate a system that was led by men and that the women that were there were very assimilated to the male leaders that they saw. It was horrible. There was gossip. We didn't really get to do anything. And the most important thing is that the project was designed in Rome. Okay, so picture this room in Rome of very fancy intellectual folks deciding what rural women in Guatemala needed. So I inherited this project, right? You're going to empower, and I remember that the objective was empower 1,600 women so that they can create their own business and succeed economically. Perfect. Sounds beautiful. I go to the ground, and women are like, we can't come to this workshop because our husbands are not letting us go. Um, or we can't come to this workshop because I don't understand what you're saying because you speak Spanish and I speak quiche or cactiquel, right? Um, so again, I've, I found myself being the bridge of this very ambitious thing that had a lot of resources and realities on the ground that were completely different. So a lot of confusion there as well. I was miserable, my husband was miserable, and he had a job that was headquartered here. So he said, we had the opportunity to go to Miami. I was like, Miami, what am I gonna do in Miami? Because I had all the stereotypes about Miami, right? Shopping, beaches, um, a lot of party, but I was like, okay, let's go and see, right? So when I come to the city with my Hispanic hat, I realized that it is such a diverse city, right? And it's like replaying that story again of a, a location or a place, because Miami is like a country, uh, that has all these mini countries inside, right? Like there's this Cuban diaspora and the Venezuelan community, but then the Haitians play an important role. What about the Black Americans that were here before? And there were all these communities that again, weren't talking to each other. And they weren't speaking the same language. Um, so I said, okay, like there's something to do here, right? I can entertain myself here. So we moved to Miami, Daniel, get ready in 2017. Where's my sound effect? <laughs> he proposed a sound effect and he, <laughs> you got this. I'll repeat it. And I moved to Miami in February of 20. Seven. Yes. <laughs> Miami. In 2017. So let's go back to that gallery, right? Like it was a gallery that at this point it was pretty full of paintings of every single color, every single technique. Um, and I, I start saying like, okay, what are the nonprofits and the NGOs that exist in the city? Because that was where my expertise was coming from, right? At this point, I I was kind of like carrying the painting of like, I'm a good project manager, right? I'm, I'm all about women's empowerment um, and I'm all about facilitation. So these are the paintings that I chose from that room. And I'm like, okay, I bring this, right? Where where can I use this? And how can I uh, give this uh, a service to the community? And um, someone tells me about social entrepreneurship. And I was like, what is that? Um, and they start explaining, right? Like it's like this combination of having a business and a sustainability mindset for social good. And I was like, okay, tell me more. Who can I start learning from? And they tell me about Radical Partners. And all of a sudden it's like I open a door to a new gallery. And when I go to on the website, it's this 
paradise for me because they were basically working with leaders and organizations across all the issues that I cared about, whether that was environment, whether that was race, that whether that was gender equity. It was all about accelerating social impact in a very integral and holistic approach. All they were looking for was for an associate. I'm like, I don't care. I'm in. So I apply. They call me the day after. They're like, we want you. We don't know what you're going to do here, but like, let's work together. So I start painting my radical partner's um, painting, which was in this new gallery because I then met Rebecca, who's the founder of Radical Partners. And I told her, look, I bring my project management skills, my equity lens, um, and then facilitation skills. And she says, what about all of the paintings that you have behind you? Like, we want that too. And it was until that moment that I realized that my diversity of thought and that curiosity of going here and there, traveling here and there and there, actually was a package that we could leverage to accelerate social impact together. So I jump in into this new gallery, we start painting more things, but more importantly, we start choosing where to put the things that we both have, right? Um, and I really loved my job back then as a strategy and impact manager. We start working on around several collective initiatives. And I was very happy just organizing the house, working with amazing leaders like Darius. Jennifer starts coaching for Radical Partners. It was a blast. Fast forward, March of 2020, that second gallery room was super full of paintings again, of amazing projects of Radical Partners. And Rebecca says, okay, I'm out. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's, I'm taking a new job as the president and CEO of the foundation. Do you now want to manage what I'm calling the gallery? What do you think I said? I said, hell no, because <laughs> I enjoy painting. I don't care about where these things go, managing contractors, et cetera. Like I, I, I wasn't interested in the business development um, aspect of it. So I said, hell no. But that was literally three years ago, March 9th of 2020. Um, but I told her, I, I will help you figure out what to do with this gallery and what to do with this space. A year, a, a week after the pandemic hits. Um, so I kind of inherited an organization in a moment of transition in every single sense. It was losing its founder. It was the pandemic. And remember what Evan said, we mostly support social impact innovators in Miami. All of them were having an identity crisis. All of them were in survival mode. So it was, it was this moment of crisis. My team was in crisis. I was in crisis because it's like, who am I? I don't know how to do this. Um, and we basically started doing phone calls, right, to the alumni. Where are you? How are you? How can we help? Some of them just wanted to cry. Some of them wanted to figure out what to do with their money. So it was this very um, interesting moment to be in. And so I told Rebecca, like, okay, this happened organically. I will step into the executive director role. So that happens in June. What happened in July of 2020? I would describe it as this, fi this country finally publicly woke up around racial disparities, right? Um, and there was, again, another crisis moment for everybody, for my team, for the organization. Who are we? What are we going to do? What's our position in our society? And everybody starting to demand and ask things from radical partners. So it was a moment in which I was like a month and a half in the role, in all honesty, uh, having to make hard decisions on like, do we go out to the streets? Do we stay here? What do we do? And it was one of the hardest decisions that I made because my team was in disagreement with my decision. But I remember when I said, if you want to go to the streets, you can. That's not our role as an organization. Our role as an organization is we're going to wait because out of this crisis, a lot of leaders are going to emerge. And when the world forgets about what happened, we're going to work with these leaders so that we actually can promote and deal with racial equity. And we said, we're gonna launch Leadership Lab, which was a program that, that we did in 2021, we said, and we're gonna do it for leaders of color, which was something that we were already doing. But if we really wanna walk the talk, we're gonna do it only by leaders of color, which meant that every single facilitator and every single coach, including Jennifer Hudson, was a person of color. Uh, and we, do it quiet, we did it quietly. And that was hard because everybody back then, they were uh, writing their manifestos, right, about diversity and equity, et cetera. We did none of that because to us, it was a part of our DNA. And we said, we're going to walk the talk with resources and things, right? So that was one of the hardest decisions that I made. And I'll be completely honest, that's, that year, I was miserable. I hated it. Uh, it was hard. 
at a personal level, at a professional level, at a managerial level, at an organizational level. It was pure survival. Because also funding was going down for us because it was the middle of the pandemic, the middle of the racial reckoning in the U.S. and therefore in the world. So resources were thanks to life going to direct services and to racial uh, equity initiatives and capacity building. And what we did was no longer a priority. So another difficult decision, what do we do? Right. Do we keep knocking on doors if, if this is the right thing for funders to do? Right. Like we don't want to get that money from Adarius, from people that are doing things on the ground, because that's what needs to be done right now. Um, so we said, we need to ramp up on the consulting side and we need to make sure that we start increasing that revenue side of our work and we start offering our services. Um, I wanna stop soon, so let me, how to fast forward. Um, so, so that was 2020, I call it the year of survival. 2021, I start getting a little bit more comfortable in my skin in terms of the role. Uh, being the successor of a founder is not an easy thing, and I don't think we talk enough about that. People will always tell me, oh, you're stepping into big shoes. I'm like, no, I'm not. I have my own shoes. She's an amazing woman, and we're friends, and she's my mentor, but I don't want to be like her. I'm not like her. She trusted me with this baby, and we'll see if the world needs it, right? So 2021 was a year of sustaining the baby, which was basically sustaining and supporting a lot of leaders. Um, in 2020, I, 2022, I called it the year of scale. And this year, I'm calling it the year of sailing because I'm tired. <laughs> I, I've been hustling so much that I, I'm finally confident to say the following, that I now own and run a social impact accelerator because I bought it two years ago from our founder. Um, and the way we accelerate social impact from a Miami-based hub is through four pillars of work. One, we invest in leaders, so we have leadership development programs. Two, we engage locals, so we try to rally uh, the community around the issues that we're trying to solve um, around these leaders that are working around that. Thirdly, we co-create solutions, and this is where our consulting side comes we build capacity, we lend capacity, we build coalitions. And last but not least, because we work with leaders, locals, and come up with innovative solutions to deal with all the bureaucracies and the things that I was dealing with at the UN, we build coalitions, right? And, and we build communities that have a particular purpose um, so that they can bring their money together, bring their resources together, time, talent, treasure, and treats. Um, to, to advance social impact in the, in the best way that we can in a most equitable way, but also faster, bigger and bolder, as I said in, in, in the podcast. Um, and now that I feel comfortable in this position, understanding that radical partners is an extension of me, um, they say, how do you manage life and work? It's like, no, no, for me, in all honesty, work is my life and life is my work. Um, so Radical Partners feels like an extension of that, and we will continue to exist as long as the world needs us, right? So there's no, no ego. Of course, it, it comes out once in a while, but we really have to ground ourselves. Like if we really want to accelerate change, we really need to understand who's doing what, where, how can we be that, that build bridge or like bridge builder organization and until we're needed. And when we're not, we will all have better salaries, better titles, and maybe some of you will hire us, um, in the future. So once I was comfortable with that, now I kind of brought in some of my favorite projects under the Radical Partners umbrella, right? So that's where the 10 Days of Connection comes in. Uh, and Athena is a great partner around that to connect locals across lines of difference. The Fuck Up Nights movement, which is a movement to talk about failure and the things that haven't gone as we wanted them to. It's part of our coalitions now. So it's kind of all fitting into places, right? Like, like a puzzle. Um, and I think I'm in the moment in which I have the opportunity to open up a new gallery, right? This was the second gallery of my life. I'm ready to kick the door and go in. I have no idea what's there. All I have is the colors and the brushes that I was born with um, so that I can design my life. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote your cousin, Jason Teeters, who says, live your life by design. No matter your conditions, no matter where you were born, yes, there's a, there's a context that affects you for sure. And that we can't control, that we can't, uh, change if we don't want to, if we can't, but we get to decide how to deal with the pain, right? So I have a teacher that says pain is real, suffering is an option. And for that, of course, you need, you need tools and community, et cetera. But th this is kind of like the message that I want to leave here, right? No matter where you are and what you're doing now, 
feel empowered enough to say you are here because you want to, or you are here because you didn't decide to do another thing. If you're like in, in a job that you hate, um, hate it a little less and do a side gig, right? Like you can make decisions to live the life that you have, because this is the life that you get, unless you're from India and you think that you're going to be born again. Still, you want to do good in this life to make sure that when you're reborn, um, things are, are good for you, but leave, live your life by design. Um, and the way I do that is every single day, I told you I'm not Zen, uh, I suck at meditating, um, but I, I do something similar to that. I, I'm also not religious, so I don't have that moment of introspection and prayer and, and great gratitude. Um, so every single day, at the end of the day, I ask myself, did I do the seven things that I really care about, which are my core values? Um, and they are, did I sleep well? <laughs> And that means that for me to sleep well, I need a nice bed and I need to have a roof on top of my head. So that means that I need to work well and in peace with myself to make sure that I'm going to sleep well. Also, if I don't sleep, I don't function. So it, it serves that whole purpose. Did I eat well? And by eating well, it means what food am I choosing, right? Who am I gathering it from uh, and what is it going to do with my body? Did I move? And remember, I told you that I was very determined and ambitious and empathetic. So I run, I do yoga, I still dance. Um, and sometimes I can't do any of that because I don't have time. So it goes back to being a little self-compassionate. And like, then if I didn't have time to do any of that, did I at least dance to a song? Did I move for 30 minutes? And I know that in 30, 40 years, that might look like Tai Chi and not a half marathon like it does right now. Um, fourth. Did I transform a life today? Not because of what I brought to the conversation, because I oftentimes serve as a mirror to others to reflect their talents um, and so that they have those aha moments and continue with their lives. Sometimes that's one life, which I'm hoping it will happen today. Sometimes it's 150, depending on the workshop or the conversation that I'm facilitating. But, but transforming lives through my work really matters to me. Fifth, did I love my people? None of this matters if my mom didn't receive a text, which is the hardest thing for me. And you will see that on Saturdays, I have my intention, love. So this is when I call my brothers, I talk to my nieces. I'm like, oh, I haven't talked to them in a week. Did I love my people? Chris, or else like, what, why are we here? And the sixth one is, did I learn something new? Some days I don't. So this is an ego check. Like, wait, who are you learning from? What are you curious about? Um, and then last but not least, did I enjoy something? And some days that looks like a massage. Sometimes I don't have time. So it looks like a longer shower. If I'm not thinking about the water crisis, right? It's very hard to be, live in all these things. So I have to find a joyful moment every single day um, just to make sure that I'm living the, the life by design. And as I said at the beginning, I really take your whys into consideration. And I want to ask you why you're going to get emotional. We're going to do that.